Over the years, gamers have located quite a few digital artifacts hidden inside their favorite games. It's pretty easy to see how they got there, but we're not sure why many of them exist in the first place. Between the depraved subject matter, the international bans, and what some felt were racist overtones, parents, politicians, and other moral authorities had plenty of reasons to hate Grand Theft Auto. They didn't need another. In 2004, Rockstar Games gave them one anyway. It's called Hot Coffee. Hot Coffee refers to a mini-game in which Grand Theft Auto San Andreas' hero, CJ, and his girlfriend get down and dirty. Kind of. You want to come in for some coffee? Yeah! The minigame wasn't actually finished, and it's about as sensual as watching two mannequins fall on top of each other over and over. It wasn't supposed to be found either. For commercial reasons, the minigame had to go, but thanks to the way that Grand Theft Auto San Andreas' code works, the minigame couldn't be deleted, it could only be hidden. That meant a modder like Patrick Wildenborg could find it. In fact, it took Wildenborg a mere 15 minutes to create Hot Coffee, the mod that unlocked San Andreas' bizarre virtual sex scenes. Before long, Rockstar was forced to replace existing copies of Grand Theft Auto San Andreas with a sex-free version, costing the developer millions of dollars. It was, by any definition, a real bona fide scandal. Portal might have introduced the malevolent AI GLaDOS to the world, but Portal 2 is the game that made us care. How have you been? I've been really busy being dead. You know, after you murdered me. Oh sure, GLaDOS has always been funny, but Portal 2 gives her a reason to be mean. She's actually Aperture CEO Cave Johnson's personal assistant, Carolyn, whose mind has been uploaded into a piece of technology. And get this, it was done against her will. Or at least, it was, in an earlier version of the game. While you might be able to piece this story together by listening to the audio logs that Cave left around his facility, the story takes a much darker turn if you fire up some of the unused audio files included with Portal 2's data. At some point, Carolyn was supposed to repeat, Sir, I do not want this. Mr. Johnson, I don't want this. I don't want this. No, listen to me. Sir, I do not want this. Her protests, which most people take to mean that Carolyn was forced to become GLaDOS against her will, are adamant and unsettling, and quickly transform Cave Johnson from a comedy villain into a straight-up abuser. As for Carolyn... Carolyn, delete. Goodbye. Some people just can't catch a break. No Man's Sky's procedurally generated universe may not be infinite, but it might as well be. If you visited every planet in No Man's Sky's digital galaxy, it'd take you about 585 billion years. As such, there's probably tons of weird stuff out there waiting for virtual astronauts to discover. But we're guessing that none of it is as weird as the stuff that Hello Games left in No Man's Sky's code. As soon as No Man's Sky hit PCs, data miners started sorting through the game's data, and they turned up some pretty interesting stuff. Some of it sheds new light on No Man's Sky's development process, like references to the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. Some of it's just funny, like the folder dedicated to No Man's Sky's in-game poop. Dig deeper though, and things start to get pretty strange. Why is the Half-Life 2 logo everywhere? We know that creepy-looking astronaut is just an early draft of our character's model, but that doesn't make it any less off-putting. The fez-wearing monkey is a nod to Hello Games' other flagship franchise, Joe Danger, but what's it doing here? Let's say you beat a relatively new game, and then hop online to discuss its cliffhanger ending. Except, once you hit the forums, everyone tells you that the game doesn't have a cliffhanger ending. Did you imagine it? Are you the victim of an elaborate prank? Do you admit that you might be going a little crazy? Or do you hold fast and stand your ground? If you're Tombstone, a poster over at the Tomb Raider forums, you do the latter. And eventually, you get the apologies that you deserve. See, Tombstone played pretty much the same version of Shadow of the Tomb Raider as everyone else. But instead of seeing a post credit sequel, with a brief nod to classic Tomb Raider, they witness something much more open-ended, a scene in which Lara receives a letter from Jacqueline Natler, the very first Tomb Raider game's big bad. For now, it just feels good to be home. Tea, Miss Croft. Lovely. Now, the ending that Tombstone found wasn't supposed to be there. According to people who worked on the game, the original post credit sequence was included in the game by accident, and the game's big day one patch was supposed to fix it. But Tombstone didn't download the patch. And even though they really did beat the game, their fellow forum readers thought he was trolling. You have our sympathies, Tombi. That sucks. 
Look, the Elder Scrolls 4 Oblivion is a big, big game. Try as it might, Bethesda was never going to squash all of its bugs. The game is simply too complex to track down every single thing that could go wrong. There are ways that Bethesda could have made things better though. For one thing, it could have removed some of the voice acting outtakes from the game before launch. It didn't though. In fact, if you want to hear some of Oblivion's cast flubbing their lines, you don't even need to pry the game's code open. Just play. That guy who hates Spriggans so much that he decides to deliver the same line twice? Spriggans. Nature's guardians, my foot. Spriggans. Nature's guardians, my foot. You'll find him. Or maybe you'll stumble across a female elf who doesn't like how she told you about break-ins at the Arcane University and asked to try again. I heard that thieves broke into the Arcane University, the Imperial Legion compound, and the temple all on the same night. Wait a minute, let me do that one again. The man who informed you that Lady Umbranox has hired a new captain of the guard, on the other hand, doesn't seem too upset with his performance, although he does forget his line and have to start over. Lady Umbranox has hired a new captain. Lady Umbranox has hired a new captain of the guard. It's pretty funny, but it begs the question, how did the ever-vigilant guys and gals at Bethesda miss these? What do you want, you... What do you want, you... you rat? You have to assume that the actor's final performances are stashed away on a desk somewhere. Somebody, somewhere, screwed up big time. You don't got me out. Arcades haven't been a major player in the United States gaming scene since Ryu, Chun-Li, Guile, and the rest of Street Fighter 2's World Warriors took the nation by storm. As a result, if you're an F-Zero fan, you might have missed out on one of the franchise's precious few titles. F-Zero AX might have launched alongside the GameCube's F-Zero GX, but it's got different pilots, different cars, and different tracks. It's a brand new game. So, naturally, F-Zero fans are gonna want to play it, which means I'll have to track down an arcade that has it. Good luck with that. Thankfully, if you're a collector, you you have a better option. If you've still got your GameCube lying around, dust it off. Pull your copy of F-Zero GX out of the closet, and if you've got an action replay handy, grab that too. As it turns out, F-Zero GX comes with a complete copy of AX on the disc. It just took racers a decade of hacking to find it. Years before Thanos stormed into theaters, Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter was arguably the most ambitious crossover event in history, especially in Japan. It even features Nori Maru, a gangly teenage otaku. No, Nori Maru never tussled with the Avengers, and you won't find him on Shadowlow's hit list. Instead, he sprang fully formed from the mind of Japanese comedian Nori Taki Kanashi, who'd collaborated with Capcom to create the bizarre fighter. Unfortunately for fighting game purists, Nori Maru was removed from from the game's Western editions. ROM hacks later revealed that Nari Maru's exclusion from international editions might have been a last minute decision. His dialogue was translated, and he's still in the game. He's just not playable. That's not the bizarre part, though. The weird thing about Nari Maru is his unused, completely inappropriate special move. The pervy schoolboy imagines various Capcom heroines, plus beefy Russian wrestler Zangief, in a variety of seductive poses, and suddenly suffers a torrential nosebleed. Of course, nosebleeds are anime and manga shorthand for arousal. Because, you know how when dudes get turned on, blood starts to flow? Yup. It's pretty clear why the move was removed, but we wish Capcom had taken Nari Maru out of the game entirely. Some things you just can't unsay. Everyone knows that you didn't buy the GameCube for its paltry third-party offerings. You bought it for the Nintendo joints like Metroid Prime, The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker, and of course Pikmin. But what if Pikmin hadn't been a GameCube exclusive? What if it had come to other platforms as well? That's not just a rhetorical question either. In a way, it did. Pikmin's tiny disc comes with a fully functioning Windows executable that, once opened, runs the game in debug mode. Now, this is a pretty trippy version of Pikmin, and not everything works like it's supposed to. There's no sound, Captain Alan Mars health always reads a zero, and if you want to see more than one Pikmin on screen at a time, you'll need to toggle a few settings. You can also access some special menus that'll let you play around with Pikmin's lighting, change the time of day, skip levels, and more. Even better, the game runs on modern PCs, so once you do the work to get it up and running, you'll be able to enjoy it on your gaming rig just fine. No emulators needed. Now, this isn't the best way to enjoy Pikmin, but for series junkies, it's kind of fun to get a glimpse into Nintendo's process. Plus, it's kind of practical. After all, your GameCube console isn't going to last forever. 
Fortnite Battle Royale might be distracting kids in school, but with Season 6, Epic decided to make up for it by giving everyone a surprise anatomy lesson. When you buy Fortnite Season 6 Battle Pass, you'll unlock Calamity, an exclusive skin starring a female cowboke. At first, Calamity is just wearing shorts, a tank top, and a cowboy hat. As you level up, she'll earn a bunch of new gear, including a form-fitting vest and a stylish duster. When Season 6 launched, however, Calamity was stuck in her regular outfit, and that caused some problems. Most of the time, Calamity looked just fine. When she danced, on the other hand, she got awfully, uh, bouncy. Somehow, Calamity's skin got its boob physics cranked way, way up, and every time that she decided to burst certain moves, like say the jubilation emote, she'd start pushing the boundaries of Fortnite's family-friendly vibe. It was a mistake, pure and simple, and Epic apologized almost immediately. This is embarrassing and unintended. An Epic representative told PC Gamer, and the company patched Calamity's jiggles out in about a day. 